Hello and welcome back to this uh, latest video. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, in this video, uh, which could end up being a series of videos, um, I want you to introduce you to this these circuit boards that I designed back in around about 1987. It was not long after I got my G0 A-Class license. And I, I started to uh, build a repeater um, a radio repeater and if you're a radio ham you know what I'm talking about uh, but if not basically it allows people to uh, communicate over over distance using this with some radios connected to it uh, in the middle uh, of the path so basically you could increase your range um, you, you would transmit to this and then this would transmit further on and pass it on to the other station and it would come back again think of it that way like a stepping stone so that's generally what a repeater does, um, connecting radios together. Now, this is the thing, this is the point of this whole, this whole uh, video really, is because I wanted to bring this back to life and show it in operation. And I quickly realized after I went through all my files and all my notes going back years in cardboard boxes uh, from storage, that I've completely lost everything. <laughs> I've lost the schematic diagram, I've lost the um, the firmware or the software that goes into the chip. I've got no listings or anything. That's a 2716 EEPROM and that holds the firmware, that holds the, uh, the program if you like to run the computer. So that's all gone and the schematic's gone for both cards. I basically have absolutely nothing. So yeah, what do we do? <laughs> well, I thought it would be huge fun to uh, reverse engineer the uh, the card, and um, you know at least get a, a schematic diagram for the for the processor for the computer. Um, possibly get a schematic diagram for the audio card as well, and um, maybe reverse engineer the software. See what we can do with that, and try and reconstruct how we did this. Because to be honest. I cannot remember a thing about the uh, the design of this. I know it's mine, but I don't remember the circuit diagram, how the how the um, the NAND, what the NAND gates are doing, how the output port works, and everything. I've completely forgotten it. It was 1987. It's gone. And as for the software and the firmware, well, there's absolutely no chance. I can't remember anything about it at all. So this is going to be huge fun, <laughs> and we're going to basically go back in time uh, to 1987 and try and figure out how this works. Back then my uh, equipment and skills were pretty limited um, and I came up with these uh, to build the repeater with and basically I've ended up with two cards. There's actually three cards. The third card is just a power supply board. I'm not going to get into that. It's just very basic uh, a linear power supply. But these are the two interesting cards and this is a, a microprocessor card, uh, or a controller card if you like, with a 6502. This has got a Rockwell 6502, and it's dated uh, 1981, um, week 31. So it's a pretty old one as well. And I designed this card uh, by hand, and it was one of my first attempts to build a, a PCB. Now, <laughs> what you have here is, I hope you can see it all right, is one of my very first attempts to make a circuit board, a PCB. And as you can see, we don't just have copper tracks, but we also have quite a lot of wire uh, jumping across as well. Uh, all this PCB was done by hand. It was done with an etch resist pen. So I'd actually draw out the tracks draw out the pads for the uh, for the chips and everything there was no I wasn't using any computers back then it was completely by hand and you, can, you know if you look closely you can tell it's done by hand as well some of the some of the tracks are a bit wonky they're not very straight and stuff like that but because it's only a single sided board and there was a lot of connections that needed to be made from the processor I had to use wire links so I used different colored wire links just to make life a little bit easier so you can you can separate the uh, 
the uh, the address bus which is the blue wires um, you can separate those from the data bus from the chip which is the these orange wires here so by using a color coded system I was able to actually create the board if you look at the other board um, this has all just got uh, other components uh, there's, a, there's a few chips here it's got four chips one two three four um, it's, it's got it's got a transistor down here some capacitors resistors um, some preset uh, variable uh, resistors there and a multi-turn uh, resistance there um, and on the back of this one which is called G0 Beasley audio board <laughs> again completely done by hand but much less complicated there's no address or data bus logic or anything like that so um, there's a couple of barge wires where I've, I made some changes after the after the design was etched so uh, I had to cut a couple of tracks and modify it slightly but generally speaking again all done by hand nothing uh, nothing produced from a computer back then so that's the audio board for the repeater and just basically I'll take you around it this is an LM567 uh, phase lock loop detector and what that's doing is it's detecting for a tone burst um, a 1750 Hz burst which you need to do to activate the uh, the repeater to get it started and uh, and that's the adjustment for the uh, the tone frequency um, you got a very simple 741 op amp here which is a little audio amplifier and that's driving the input of the uh, phase lock loop so this is all for the tone detection circuit uh, when you first key up the repeater and you start the repeater you need that to activate the repeater otherwise the repeater will not do anything um, you've got an NE566 here which is an oscillator um, we're using it uh, as a, a triangle oscillator actually a triangular output oscillator and that goes through a little bit of um, filtering here to get it pretty close to a sine wave output because this is a triangle it gets filtered it ends up being a sine wave round about here at this point here and you can adjust the frequency of that audio oscillator and this is the oscillator which produces the CW that you hear uh, when the when the uh, when the repeater activates and also it gives out its ident in Morse code uh, and you'll hear that later on at some point I hope and the um, and it also gives pips between transmissions so when you uh, leave go of the microphone when you finished saying what you want to say and you pass it over to the other person then you get a pip a uh, really little short burst that all comes from this little oscillator here and you've got this chip here which is a 4066 and the 4066 is a quad switch a uh, quad bilateral switch if you want to give it its proper name that actually uh, keys the oscillator and it also does a couple of other things like muting the uh, the audio turns the audio on and off so you can actually stop people from talking through the repeater if you wish you can cut them off so it's basically just a switching device uh, which routes either the CW or the audio from the uh, from the operator who's talking and that's kind of it this runs from a a double supply a split supply it's got ground it's got plus five and minus five so it needs a plus and minus five power supply and these are all of the pins which connect to the outside world these pins here pretty much connect to these pins here on the control card so the first thing to do is let's get these boards wired up and uh, that means I'm gonna to have to make some connections from here to here um, from you know from the audio card to the processor card let's connect this to some radios <laughs> all right let's get this on the bench Connect it to some radios and um, into dummy loads, of course. We can't, we're not allowed to put them in their proper aerials, but we'll do it all on the bench as a test, as an experiment. That's all perfectly fine. And let's see if this thing actually works. Okay, so here we are. And as you can see, I've managed to wire up the uh, main repeater CPU card and the um, analog card are now connected uh, through this bunch of wires on the right hand side there and we've also got the whole thing connected to a couple of radios a couple of transceivers so we've got 
one radio here on the two meter band which is um, I think it's an FT2700 which is the receive radio so there's no transmit action going on here it's all received through these connections here and this one here is a little Alinko radio also on two meters and this one is the transmit radio so we're having to use two different radios here because it's a full duplex system you know we have to receive and transmit both at the same time with a 600 kilohertz uh, shift so at the moment we are receiving on 145 100 that's 145 decimal 100 on the on the receiver and we're outputting or transmitting on 145 700 on the uh, on the transmit radio now at the moment uh, because of license restrictions um, I'm not allowed to actually uh, rebroadcast any other station uh, using my home call sign G0BZY so um, we've got the whole transmitter going into a dummy load here so the signal's not really going anywhere it's just in the shack uh, for test purposes but it's not none of these are connected to an aerial um, in fact uh, in fact the receiver is not connected to anything at all <laughs> it's just got an open connector but because of the RF levels locally in the shack it works so anyway um, just had to point that out so here's the analog receive card and the, uh, the phase lock loop which is detecting for a tone that's waiting for a tone burst and we have a little uh, NE566 um, oscillator which is our keying oscillator for sending CW and some other various bits and bobs but the main heart of the uh, of the thing is the is the computer which is the 6502 based uh, computer um, we've got the EEPROM that's being programmed and we're going to be reverse engineering that later uh, using some software techniques and we're also going to be reverse engineering the um, the actual hardware um, the circuit of uh, how this works haha -ha. now what you just heard there was uh, the repeater just sent its CWI dent after every 10 minutes so it's been on for 10 minutes and it just sent its CWI dent and that has been transmitted and we're picking it up on this little handy talkie just here which is also tuned to 145700 which is the output frequency okay so we can test this just by let's try and uh, let's try and start the repeater so I'm going to key up the transmitter here as I say we're all very local this has also got a dummy load on the end of it so we're not using any aerials for anything here and if I just key up um, without any tone burst you'll see some LED indicators here you'll notice I fitted some LEDs I'll see if I can zoom in a bit on that let's have a look at this and you'll see this LED here when I key up here that one lights up there yeah so what's happening there is it's there there is a squelch line a squelch detect line coming from the receiver uh, the receiver radio and I've had to tap into the circuit within the radio to do that in order to uh, get access to the um, the busy indicator or the or the squelch line so every time the squelch opens in other words somebody's transmitting um, I get a um, a low signal from the radio and that's driving into here uh, along into this connection here and that's what's given us the signal here so just by transmitting on the walkie-talkie here uh, you'll see the LED light up okay but you'll notice that the repeater itself isn't activating and that's because we've got no tone burst so you need squelch and you need tone burst both at the same time so let's do that I'll press a different button on the radio now and this will send the tone burst and there it is and that's coming out of the um, out of the work out of the walkie talkie test one two three golf zero bravo zulu yankee okay one two three four five this is a test g zero bzmy and there you go and we're getting our pips eventually it will stop and 
that's it. So <laughs> the whole thing's working great. And uh, so we're able to use a walkie-talkie to key up the transmitter with a tone burst. Uh, if there's no tone burst present, it doesn't respond, so it's filtering that out. And we're getting audio, CW, ident, um, being transmitted through the transmitter radio here. And the receiver is here. So the whole thing is working as an actual repeater. So I'm really delighted <laughs> that we've been able to bring back to life this project that that I designed and built back in 1987 I think it was I'm not exactly certain but like what we're saying we've lost all of the documentation for this and uh, we've got no schematic diagram and we've got no um, software uh, listings or anything from the uh, the EEPROM it's a 2716 um, EEPROM that so absolutely delighted <laughs> brought the thing back to life again connected it to some radios I did have to change one or two things had to add a little a little uh, DC blocking capacitor to get the transmitter to work properly there was a strange thing going on with the Alinko radio where you had to have it the microphone audio into it it had to be decoupled uh, otherwise it was doing strange things with the radio so I had to add that I've changed a couple of components like this uh, tacked on little preset resistor here which didn't work very well so I've had to put a new one in to get it to work and a couple of other things just tidy up the wiring and that sort of thing but generally speaking um, it's come back to life and as I say we can now actually uh, switch it on uh, it's a bit of a shame I wasn't able to put this into a, a real live on-air situation with uh, you know connected to two aerials uh, because uh, we'd actually be able to have a QSO with somebody locally and see what they think about what it sounds like over the air. But as I said, because of license, licensing restrictions, I'm not actually allowed to do that without a, um, a special repeater license. So we're just doing this locally on the bench into dummy loads, which is fine. So let's just try that one last time. That's the tone burst. And I'll just talk through the walkie-talkie. Golf Zero, Bravo Zulu Yankee testing. And there he is. This is G0 BZY. 12345 54321. This is a test. Yeah. And after about five, I think it's about five pips, it'll just switch off. And it'll give it CWI then. And that's it and the transmitter now goes back to receive and everything goes back to standby fantastic yippee <laughs> I'm really happy to see this work um, it's been a very long time I think back in 1987 uh, I was doing some tests with it but it never got on the air it never actually got connected to anything so it's wonderful to actually see this connected to two radios um, you know receiving and transmitting in full duplex with a 600 kc shift just like the repeater would have been back at the time uh, they still use the 600 kc shift to this day but um, this is using a, a tone burst of 1750 hertz uh, 1.75 kilohertz to activate the repeater which is the way that they used to do it uh, these days that's all uh, that's all gone and they use sub audio tones uh, like you know uh, anything below 300 hertz to activate the repeater now this could actually be modified um, to um, the audio card itself could be modified the PLL detector which is detecting the tone that could be modified and changed to detect sub audio tones so this system could potentially be uh, made to work with modern day equipment but of course you wouldn't really bother now because um, this is all very it's all very old 6502 processor don't forget we're doing this really for fun because you know we're interested in electronics and it's all a bit retro from the 80s which is uh, which is always a great thing uh, it's the same process they used to use in the Vic 20 the Commodore Vic 20 and the Commodore 64 and a few other computers as well 
Um, I think they use it in the, uh, is it the Acorn or something like that? But the BBC Micros, of course, they were used in a few computers, so it's really nice to play with this kind of thing. What you could do, of course, is replace this entire board with one single microcontroller. Um, and you wouldn't need any of that these days, because technology's come along so far. So this is all like old stuff, but it's all great fun, and that's what we're here for. So, anyway, great to see this work. I hope you enjoyed this. And, uh, of course, in the next part, we're going to be reverse engineering this thing. So we're going to be looking at the uh, reverse engineering the schematic diagram. How does this thing work? Don't forget, we've got no documentation. It all got lost many years ago. So we're going to reverse engineer it. We're going to come up with a clean schematic diagram. Um, and we're going to look at the data within the uh, EEPROM in the, the 2716 here. We're going to disassemble the code from that. Uh, and make it into a, um, a readable form that we can understand a bit better th than just like binary digits uh, than hex format. So we're going to go through the process of reverse engineering the software and as a final step we're going to try and redesign the entire PCB just because we want to. <laughs> there's, there's no need to do this but we're going to redesign the PCB and we're going to um, put it on a brand new board and then see if we can get that one to work at the very end as well. So it's all a bit of a learning exercise and it's a lot of fun. We're looking at retro things here and we're going to try and bring them back to life. And it's fantastic to see this work again. So I hope you've enjoyed this particular little video and uh, tune in for the next ones where we're going to start reverse engineering the circuit. Thanks very much for watching and see you next time. G0BZY, Golf Zero Bravo Zulu Yankee testing.